Welcome back to Press Coverage. I'm Theo Greminger. Uh, at Press Coverage, we're always trying to find the edges. We're going to try to find actionable information, and we're trying to help you win your league. And my guest today is one of the best uh, analysts in all of fantasy. This is Scott Barrett with us of Fantasy Points. Scott came on First Class Fantasy uh, in a June and just crushed it. So I said, Scott, can we run it back? He said, after my big article. And then I hit him up again, and he says, I'm still working on my big article. And then I hit him up again. He's like, my article's over. I'm ready to rock. So we're ready to rock today. We're ready to help you win your league. Um, Scott, why don't you tell everybody about this big piece that you drop? It's it's great. I read it uh, all over the last few days. I thought it was tremendous. It was very, very well thought out. And let everybody know where they can find it. Yeah, that's over at fantasypoints.com. This is Scott Barrett's draft guide, I think I'm calling it, uh, formerly known as My Guys. Uh, but this is where you could find my rankings, my strategy tips, uh, my must draft players, my Exodia players. Uh, basically, you just read this and like that's all you need to dominate your fantasy leagues. To just this one article, you can forget all the rest. This is the one. It's very good. I, I like when when my my like priors are confirmed and, and I had a couple of guys that I've been drafting that were on, on the article. So I thought that was really cool. And you did open my eyes up to a couple of guys. So I will say that it's worth purchasing this article. A couple of guys that I was kind of neutral for, but I'm not going to give them away on the pod, but you should definitely check it out. It kind of opens up, makes a bull case for a few of these guys. Um, we're not going to discuss the Exodia players, but those are also an interesting, interesting. We'll give away one. We'll give away one. We're going to give, we're going to get, we're going to get into it. Um, but I want to first ask, you know, the question that I've been asking every single guest, uh, for like maybe, maybe the last six weeks, whether they're on press coverage, whether they're on first class fantasy, um, and then any pod I've been filling in on, I've also been asking it. You spend so much time with this article, Scott, you also rank players, you obviously put like a great deal of time and attention. You try to put in the range of outcomes and you, you come up with a, with a really detailed list. You actually tier them. What's the one player that if you could know their final stats for this season, who would it be? Is it a player that's really difficult for you to gauge a player that has, you know, many things that could happen that could sway them one way or another, or maybe a player that, unlock some teammates based on how they do how well they do or how well they don't do i i have no idea i i missed this question in the show sheet this is a great question i feel like it would have to be a quarterback who has a wide range of outcomes and a number of receivers relying on him um Someone like Deshaun Watson, I guess, who was a that's top been my five. answer. That's been my answer for every single guest. You're not supposed to say Deshaun Watson. I'm supposed to sound smart with that. But but build on that one. I love that, Scott. Go ahead. Yeah, he's finished top five in fantasy points per game every year of his career, except for last year. Uh, Amari Cooper's being drafted pretty high. David Njoku's being drafted pretty high. I'm not really on that one. Uh, Elijah Moore, one of my guys. Um and so, yeah, it's just, is he back to being who he was or who he was at the tail end of last season? What I'll just say about that is, well, he was super rusty. It was like two years in between his last start to a, his first start this season. And uh, the worst strength of schedule over that span, as well as the worst weather luck over that span. It was like an average temperature of like 26 degrees and like 19 mile per hour winds. Um so, you know, it's easy to to make an upside argument for a player who is being drafted as, what, the QB9 when he's finished top five every year of his career. But uh, he's not a player I'm all that excited to draft, and I, I don't really have a good reason why. I just keep kind of going back and forth on it. What do you think? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I love that you said Deshaun Watson because, for me, that's been the guy that I've been talking about, like, for weeks now because I, I haven't really been pulling the trigger on him. It's either been – you know, potentially diving into like that Trevor Lawrence range, which is before him or diving into that, that like pocket of, of low end QB ones and high end QB twos that are behind him. But he's also, you're seeing so many of these Cleveland Browns being steamed up in drafts. So I think like seeing his final touchdown total would make a huge difference. Um, and if he returns back to Houston form, then that's kind of the, the cheat code this year. I don't know if QB one, is in the range of outcomes, but I think that he could be like a top three quarterback. So we've had a number of really interesting answers for this. Uh, Kadarius Tony has been one that a few people have said just because, you know, kind of unlocks the other chiefs wide receivers. It, it I already you know, know the answer to that one. Why don't you share it? 
he finishes as the wide receiver seven on a fantasy point per game basis. How many games does he play? I have no idea. But well, wide receiver we'll seven that. on fantasy point per game. So we'll we'll take that one for sure. Well, we're going to dive into a number of Scott's uh, strategy tips. We're going to talk about some positional values, and Scott is going to share his must draft tight end uh, when we return after a word from our sponsor. Hey, we've got to talk about Rival Fantasy today. Rival Fantasy, they're a huge supporter of everything we do, the podcast channel, the YouTube channel. It's possible because of Rival, and they have an incredible new offer with promo code PLAYER. Promo code PLAYER, you double your deposit up to $200, and you get $25 in bonus bucks. So it's $225 additional to play in NFL preseason. You can do their props on the fantasy book where it's over, under, over, under, over, under, up to five guys. The more over-unders you hit, the higher your payout. And they have their challenges for the community. You can say, hey, I think that Player X is going to go over this many fantasy points, and someone takes you up on it. They take the other side. It's great. I love their fantasy bingo, where you can do five across, you can do four in the corner, black it out, just predicting fantasy points on your favorite players, especially in preseason. The promo code is PLAYER, where they match your deposit up to $200 plus... Those $25 in bonus bucks. This offer is insane. Does Matt have a acting background? Matt is great at one take ads and, and there it's, it's very, very good stuff. He's done. He's done a really, really good job um, with, with his delivery on a number of those. The sponsors are happy and uh, that's so good. High praise, Scott. High praise. Yeah, Yeah. And I will give you some props. You're the only guest who's ever appeared on First and 15. Abibag Batoba actually joined me earlier this week on press coverage. Um, but you guys are all in the Houston area. And Abib told me he's getting a big guest. And, and he kind of kept it on, on like, you know, under wraps. And then you got to sit on the couch with with Dio and, uh, and Chris and Abib. That was pretty cool. Highly recommend that one. Uh, if you're on our YouTube page, you can just scroll down and find First and 15. But that was pretty cool. How did that come to be, Scott? Yeah, I've been uh, friends with Abib for a while. Uh, he hit me up to to do a podcast. I'm like, yeah, sure. And he's like, all right, here's the address. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've been on Sig Bloom's on the couch virtually, but now I'm literally going on the couch with Abib. Yeah, that was that was an absolute blast. Uh, those are all super sharp guys. Uh, a lawyer and two doctors, as well as like the greatest high stakes player in football fantasy football history potentially. So uh, that was a blast. Great show. Uh, Abib is really one of the sharpest guys ever. Um, so check that out. Yeah, definitely check that one out. And I would say like Abib is is on the Mount Rushmore. What he did to win back to back uh, players championships is is never going to be done again. We did see uh, Go Bills. They pulled back to back main events, which is crazy. And then Chad that Schroeder. Crazy. Chad Schroeder is like, you know, he's he's probably the goat. Definitely won the most money. Uh, he'll be uh, with Billy Muzio and I next week on, on First Class Fantasy. That'll be uh, a fun one to listen into. But today we're going to dive in. Uh, Scott, you dropped your, your big article. But before this, you were known for Upside Wins Championships. It was a tremendous piece. What was the first year you dropped that article? It was uh, 2020. That was uh, one of my proudest works. Honestly, it's like pretty derivative derivative to a bunch of stuff Adam Harstad had done previously, but it's just like something I, I like had in the back of my mind forever and just like couldn't perfect perfectly articulate it. And then just like one day everything clicked, sat down behind my computer and I just kind of like blinked and vomited up 4,000 words. And uh, yeah, that's, that's like my proudest piece. Like maybe it's not my best piece or the most actionable, but it was like one that it was just like in the back of my mind for so long that I, I was really proud of the job I did with that. No, you absolutely did. And I think you, you took uh fantasy football and you broke it down into kind of a, a, a way that you could kind of maximize your upside and explaining why we should draft in this style. And uh, you've had some, some big time hits with some of your player takes, but I think that one stands the test of time. Definitely would check that one out. I mean, I put that up with like, I think Sean Siegel's zero RB article was fantastic. That's evergreen. Uh, Josh Larkey actually dropped when he was at player profiler, probably the best article I've ever read on stacking and correlation. And I'll, I'll put your guys articles up there. I mean, it's just fantastic. Um, and that definitely stands the test of time. But one thing you talk about in that article, 
is you talk about how like oftentimes we hear people using stock language business terms in terms of how we analyze fantasy football and you talk about how fantasy football is like the stock market but there are some kind of big differences uh namely it's it's a little slightly less predictable maybe kind of build on that a little bit scott yeah so i i have uh something of a stock background my, my dad worked on wall street for like 30 years i finished third place in the new jersey stock exchange tournament when I was uh, a high school senior. I also worked for a hedge fund, one of the Tiger Cubs uh, in New York City. And uh, I always thought fantasy football was like exactly like the stock market. You know, you you see a company or you see a player, you think they're undervalued. So you invest in them, right? And the, th the thing is, it's like exactly the opposite of the stock market where you just want a high margin of safety is what Seth Klarman would, would call it. Warren Buffett would so, sort of say the same thing. Uh, you want a, a, a blue chip stock, you know, that's not going to lose value. That's just going to uh, give you strong returns year over year. Um, and, and, and lose uh, a stock declining is back in value is, is massively dangerous to compound interest, interest, which is what uh, Albert Einstein called the, eighth wonder of the world. Like that's, that's what you want. Safety, uh, compound interest, but with fantasy football, it's kind of the opposite of that because you're competing against one out of 12 people. You're, so your chances of actually making money are, are quite low. Um, and you have this floor, this, this safety net of the waiver wire to fall back on. Uh, so you can and should be swinging for the fences when you're in a fantasy football draft. Whereas with the stock market, it's more about avoiding losses. And with this, it's, it's, it's sort of like the uh, Peter Klein approach. You know, you want 10 baggers is what you want from fantasy players. No, I love it. And I think it's, it's a very interesting way of, of looking at things. And it's, I think that the safe player, the player that kind of needs to see it first before they're able to draft somebody those players are oftentimes dead in the water. Certain certain years, those kind of guys are going to hit, um, you know, building on safety, building on, you know, looking at previous seasons only in your projections. But most of the time, I think that the most dangerous players are the ones that are able to put builds together where they're very forward thinking. They're looking at upside. They're drafting like they're correct. They're not drafting scared and trying to make up for things in the back rounds. And I think that that article just, it's, it stays evergreen. And one really, really strong uh, comment you have in that article, and I'll read it verbatim. A player's best case projection is far more important than their base case projection, which is more important than their worst case projection. And in the later rounds, a player's worst case projection for their risk is wholly irrelevant. I said that this is an incredible statement. But how can we make this a part of our draft plan? Is it so, so simplistic that you're avoiding the James White types, the safety net players? Um, is it that simple, Scott? As when we when we go further and further down the list of the draft. Yeah. So so when I dug into that article, I talked about the 2019 season, where people like power law players is what you want to be shooting for in fantasy football, like players who can just break fantasy football, which, which is exactly what Christian McCaffrey did. Lamar Jackson did to a lesser extent. It was something like uh, teams that had both McCaffrey and Lamar Jackson were 75% likely to win their championship. It didn't matter who else was on that team, or you just take Christian McCaffrey, a team of Christian McCaffrey and a bunch of play like best players on your waiver wire beat out a team with the QB three, the RB six, the RB seven, the wide receiver eight, the wide receiver five, the wide receiver nine and the tight end three. Like that is insane. Just like how potent one player can be. And so, yeah, I am completely fading the safety net players uh, just because like a low end QB one is worthless. Like the QB 11 is going to give you 1.6 fantasy points per game more than the best QB off of waivers. They, a mid-range to low-end tight end one, worthless. A, a low-end RB2, people are like, oh, that's a starter, you know? Like, let me draft this guy. He's going to beat his ADP and finish as the RB22. That's effectively worthless. So, like, when I'm drafting players, 
like if I'm drafting a tight end, it's entirely built around the percentage likelihood that he finishes top three at the position and fantasy points per game. It's, it's not that he, can he beat ADP in best ball? That's exactly what you want. You want ADP beaters and just like a bunch of safe players guaranteed production, but in a start sit league where you have the safety net of the waiver wire to fall back on, you do want to be swinging for the the fen- fences. And as you progress through the draft, the more rounds that go on, the more you want to be swinging for the fences. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think that you bring up the tight end position. Uh, this is off show sheet, but you know, there's been such a weird pushback on Dalton Kincaid and Sam Laporta. I'm big on drafting Kincaid, and also I've been drafting some Laporta. Kincaid's been like one of my guys at Player Profiler since before the draft, and I think it's very funny that we're seeing these arguments against drafting him. You bring up the fact that tight end, you need to be swinging for the fences. Are these not potential cheat code guys based on the unknown upside and the potential flat scoring at the position? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're simpatico on the philosophy here. I, I would just question their upside. Um, I do think, you know, Dawson Knox makes a lot of money. I, I do think they still trust him as the tight end one. They're going to play more 12 personnel because they were dead last in 12 personnel. But like, even if they're, you know, the sixth highest team by 12 personnel, that still means he's not on the field a lot. The the upside argument for him is, oh, maybe he's, he's Cole Peasley. I still just worry that you know, the, the snaps aren't there. And then Laporta, it's like, well, Hawkinson had to go to Minnesota to become this, you know, fantasy monster. And so I just kind of worry about a rookie there, but in dynasty, like I have a ton of exposure to both those guys. I I really like both those guys. I think some better examples. I just want to caution the listener that let's not conflate risk with upside. So like a player like Keenan Allen to me, people think he's like, oh, he's, very safe, high floor, but he's low. Se- like, I don't see that. Like he's finished as a fantasy wide receiver one in six straight seasons. We know his upside. That's great upside. He's just also like an extreme value. And then there's players like Justin Ross. Like I, you know, I, I've been, I've been calling Justin Ross a league winner since we saw him limping up that, that hill in February. And I'm like, Oh, he's back. Let's go. But just with him, it's like the, the criticism I'm getting is like, you know, uh, he, He's, he's not a starter. Uh, we don't know about his medicals. Uh, you know, he's going to bust. That's like a stupid, but like when you're talking about a round 18 player, like, yeah, of course he's going to probably going to bust. Like every player in that range is going to bust or even the ones that hit probably aren't going to be starters for you. So then it, it's a question of what's his upside. And to me, it's like he had arguably the greatest wide receiver season by any college player ever when you factor in his age, his target competition. And now he's playing with Patrick Mahomes. And I don't think MVS is very good. I don't think Justin Watson's very good. I don't think Sky Moore is very good. So I see massive upside. I see massive upside relative to everyone else in that ADP range. So like, if you're thinking about it, like I am, you're okay. Risk is irrelevant for a round 18 player. And then incomparable upside. So yeah, he's a great pick. And what's the worst case that happens? Okay. You drop him and then you pick up someone else who has more upside. Yeah, no, I love it. And you use the word true difference makers. And I think you've, you've used a stat uh, in years past, Scott, I believe I'm attributing uh, this to you correctly, but running back one and running back 24 outscore running back six and seven. Is that the usual yearly math? I think this was a Scott Barrett. Point. Yeah, I think it's something else. I think it's like RB1 versus RB6 outscores the RB7 versus RB30, something like yeah. that, where it's like, yeah, you really want those uh, true difference makers, those power law players, uh, the power law outcomes. Like if you look back at the past 20 fantasy seasons, like who gave their teams the best odds of winning the championship? It's the RB1. And so, uh, wide receivers are safer, but the running back is more important, more valuable because they have incomparable upside relative to their peers at that position. And also just the typically score more fantasy points. So this was actually, I was saving this for one, one of the last questions, but this kind of leads us into it. Christian McCaffrey, you talked about on Twitter, a bull case for McCaffrey 
um, in terms of absolutely smashing, and you used air yards um, as one statistic that you were that you were very intrigued by. Um, him potentially setting an all-time record for air yards this year. I'll make a slight pushback. I think that the bear case for against McCaffrey and against Austin Eckler is we simply haven't seen a running back this late in their career finish as RB1 since it's been a long time, Scott. I'm talking about pre-Jamal Charles days where we're looking at a running back that's in year seven. When you're starting to look at identifying your RB1, do you care about that at all? Or are you just looking at these guys as separate entities and, you know, McCaffrey is what he is. Um, he's maybe insulated by his pass catching ability and, and those sort of things. No, that's that's something I look into. Um, that's another reason why I, I'm embracing wide receivers earlier than I typically would, just because we have so many running backs being drafted early who are either past the age cliff like Derrick Henry or on the precipice of the age cliff. I will just say uh, I, I historically pass catching running backs have aged more gracefully than early down runners. And then on top of that, it's just like they have a massive floor in, in PPR leagues targets are worth 2.5 times as much as carries. And like, you know, two things I feel really good about are these are the two running backs who are going to lead the league in receptions this year. Uh, so they have a massive floor just based on that. And then a sky high ceiling as well. That is really how you get these power law outcomes at the position is these sort of PPR cheat code running backs. And maybe talk a little bit about the air yard stat that you referenced and why you're so <laughs> bullish about him uh, doing that this year in this Kyle Shanahan offense. Uh, yeah. So Air yards are totally irrelevant for running backs, except for one season. One season ever, it was David Johnson who set the air yardage record uh, for running backs. I think he had like five deep targets. And obviously he was a fantasy juggernaut. He was being split out wide. And to me, it's just that, well, if Kyle Shanahan, probably the best offensive play caller in football, invented the wide back role for Debo Samuel. Like, why don't we think he's going to get just as creative with Christian McCaffrey? This is a player, you know, multiple film heads, Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson, Brett Whitefield all said, if he was, I refuse to play running back. I'm a slot wide receiver still easily would have been drafted in round one. And so there's massive upside there. He's actually not my RB one. I, I just worry a little too much about the splits with and without Elijah Mitchell. Um, you know, with Mitchell, uh, 61% of the carries without that was cut in half XTD market share cut in half, uh, snap share 82% to like 63%. Uh, so that's a concern, but like the thing is like, Hey, if he gets that, you know, wide receiver masquerading as running back role, you could have two running backs on the field. You could split them out. Uh, he could just absolutely break fantasy leagues. And, and we've seen that from Christian McCaffrey in the past. Yeah, and we saw it last year in a small sample size with Brock Purdy, how you know his splits with Purdy were you know so impressive in the points per game uh, um, level. So I, I think I'm kind of with you. I just, for me personally, I haven't been pulling the trigger on him. Uh, I've been leaning towards wide receiver just based on how it kind of uh, you know it breaks down. Um, but I have a little bit of McCaffrey. I just feel like I hope it's not the player that really really burns me, and I went like Jamar Chase over him or. Kelsey over him in tight end premium or something like that. Um, want to get back to league winning upside, high upside players. And one way that drafters have been able to find unknown upside was attacking second year wideouts. Last year, we saw Devonta Smith drafted as wide receiver 39, wide receiver 40, absolutely smashes ADP. We also see Jalen Waddell. We see Amon Ross St. Brown. They really beat their ADPs uh, fairly strongly. There was a couple of misses. Um, in terms of like Tony, uh, we'll get to Elijah Moore later on, but, but second year wide out, like the cool thing to say is second year wide receivers are cheat code this year. There's a lot of them. Um, you know, we see Christian Watson, excuse me. We see Christian Watson. We see Drake London. Uh, we see Traylon Burks, Jahan Dotson. All these guys are getting kind of, uh, you know, pushed down when compared to Alave and Wilson, who would be your favorite non Alave Wilson second year wide receiver to draft this year. Yeah, I'll just say in Dynasty, Rashid Shahid's probably like a top three value in, in Dynasty startups right now. But uh in redraft, my my answer to this is definitely Christian Watson. 
Uh, I loved him coming out. Uh, I loved his film. He reminded me of my comp for him was if Randy Moss were mortal, my model really liked him. This is a guy like just about every other analytics person was down on. I really liked him. And then he was awesome as a rookie. Uh, he ranked from, from week 10 on, which is when he first started to see full time usage, uh, he ranked 10th among all wide receivers in fantasy points per game. He led all wide receivers in yards per route run. Uh, on the full season, he led all wide receivers in fantasy points per route run. Uh, he averaged 2.26 yards per route run. That was the seventh best mark since 2010. Uh, fifth best if touchdown adjusted. And these are like the best, most predictive stats for sophomore wide receivers. On that last list, like here's the top five, OBJ, AJ Brown, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Christian Watson. And so all these lists kind of are just stacked with future superstars. Um, minimal competition for targets, uh, especially high value targets. Like people talk about the unsustainable touchdown rate, uh, which is true, but like to a lesser degree than you think, just because he ranked top three in percentage of targets inside the 10 yard line, top three in deep target percentage. So he was getting those high value targets. Uh, he's an elite playmaker, seemingly houses five-yard dump-offs at will. Uh, I just see both an underrated floor and a sky-high ceiling. Love this player. Yeah, Billy Musio and I have been really, really high on Watson. It's been a guy that I've been selecting right routinely in the fourth round. Um, I think it's just kind of funny how people want to poke holes in him. Uh, you know, I think that they, they've used his unsustainable touchdown rate as a negative but he's scoring touchdowns by running away from the defense and looking like the most athletic guy on the field. It's like sometimes this can be a simple game and you bring up the target competition. His target competition right now is a fellow second year wide out and a rookie slot wide receiver. Um, both those guys, uh, Romeo Dubs and, and Jaden Reed, you know, we don't dislike them, but they certainly lack that kind of upside. And there was rookie tight ends as well. So I'm with you. I think Christian Watson has been a guy that I'm going to continue to draft, but Scott, I'm a little surprised because you don't see his ADP really rising. It's sitting there. Wide receiver 24. I think I've seen him as like wide receiver 21, somewhere in that wide receiver 21 to wide receiver 25 range. So you're not really having to reach for a guy with this sort of, uh, you know, double digit touchdown outcome. Yeah. I, one of the best values in drafts right now. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Let's talk about the running back position. You know, you've talked about how running back is the most important position in fantasy and there isn't a close second um if you win or lose your league it's probably because you drafted the right or wrong running backs we also see this year um a real propensity for a hero rb or simply a zero rb or one of these modified zero rb starts where people are you know really attacking wide receiver maybe mixing in a tight end and then starting their running back plan in let's call it the fourth round where are you at with if you're going to go hero where are the rounds you're looking to draft running backs without giving away the names? Um, let me see. There is an RB 29 on Yahoo. I have RB 13. There is an RB 25 on NFL.com. I have RB 15. There is an RB 32 on Yahoo. I have RB 22 and I'm probably going to bump him after this show. Um, so yeah, like, Running back's the most important position in fantasy. Uh, but like I said earlier, there's all of these running backs on the precipice of the age cliff, uh, running backs with high ADPs. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, uh, some serious injuries like Javante Williams, Brees Hall, J.K. Dobbins uh, coming off of serious injuries. Uh, bell cow running backs who get a high percentage of carries and targets don't really split work. Bell cow RBs seem to be a dying breed. Uh, you know, we have an 18 week schedule now. It's another game your running back could get hurt. But also, when I watched all these post draft press conference interviews, just about every GM who took a running back day one or day two said, Yeah, you know, like uh, we really need that extra help to lighten up the load, keep our running backs healthy for full season, come playoff time. So, like, they also indicated that, you know, just about every team is adopting more of a committee approach. We have Josh Jacobs, Jonathan Taylor, JK Dobbins, uh, potentially holding out. And so there's just like massive risk here. There's always been massive risk. Uh, but this year, like 
I'm drafting, I like taking more of a zero RB or hero RB approach for one reason and one reason only. And that's the value I just alluded to in the middle rounds. Like I, I'm just drafting a ton of those plays. Those are extreme values. So like, yeah, why would I take two running backs in the first two rounds when we have those players just sitting there? So, you know, we, well, I think we're on the same page with some of these builds. Um, but, you know, we what as a concept, people always talk about the running back dead zone where, you know, you're writing these articles in 2018, 2019. You're talking about running back 10 going off the board at like pick 12. Now you're seeing running back 10 drop to the third round. Do we need to kind of get rid of the term running back dead zone and just try to target the correct running backs in each round? Or do you still think there reaches a point where, it's kind of an avoiding range of running backs. Yeah, I, I really avoid anything dead zone. It Every season is its own unique, special snowflake. And we saw that last year, like the, the best players you could have drafted were dead zone running backs like Josh Jacobs, the year before dead zone wide receivers like Debo, Jamar Chase, Cooper Cup. So um, every season is its own unique snowflake. I really just kind of throw that stuff out. Yeah, no, I like that. I think... That's one thing where, you know, you have dogmatic rules and they totally change in fantasy. It was for a while we were looking at late round QBs. Now we're back to having QBs pushed up for a while. It was don't draft wide receivers on new teams. And that's been terrible advice for the last few years. Uh, New team wide receivers have absolutely crushed. Let let Um, me just say one thing, though. Uh, Tight end position is a little different. Uh, There's only been like one valuable dead zone tight end over the past seven years. That was TJ Hawkinson last year. But yeah, historically like tight end four through tight end 10 by ADP just never does anything. And it is like the right way to approach the position you want. I call them oligarch tight ends, the the rule over the rest of the peasants. You really just want Travis Kelsey historically, or you just full on punt the position, grab two late round guys with upside. So that's a, a good segue because Scott, you're going to reveal your must draft tight end. You know, you got to you got to pay for a little bit of this. Uh, he's giving you Christian Watson, and now Scott's going to give you his must draft tight end this season. Highly recommend you go and get the article if you want the rest. But go for it, Scott. Who is the tight end that we should be targeting that's going to help us win fantasy championships this year, based on his cost and his ability, and how you expect him to do this year? Yeah, that's that's Darren Waller. Uh, he's my tight end three. Like, I don't, I don't feel shaky about it. Is my tight. I feel great about it. Uh, listen, he's, uh, Daniel Jones is wide receiver one. This is the best wide receiver one Daniel Jones has ever had. He's going to be targeted as such everything per sources or out of training camp backs that up. Uh, you know, they had to take Darren Waller off the field just because Daniel Jones was locking onto him way too much. So like, that's a, that's a great sign to me. And like, again, you want tight ends with oligarch upside. He was putting up fantasy wide receiver one numbers the last season he was fully healthy. And I think that's what he can give you this year. If you tell me Darren Waller finishes the season as the wide receiver 10, that would not surprise me at all. And then that's a massive advantage over actually drafting the wide receiver 10. You would rather have a tight end putting up those numbers for sure because of the the difference in, in positional uh, value. So uh, yeah, love me some Darren Waller this year. Yeah, I love it. And just to put context into what Scott has said, like usually Travis Kelsey finishes around wide receiver six, if you want to compare that. So we're talking about a very impactful score for, for Waller. I, I said that the, to somebody this week that he's going to get 130 targets and they, they quickly corrected me that that was too many for a tight end to get, and he's more like 110. But could you see this being just like, is it is there a better fit for Darren Waller than Daniel Jones? I mean, you talk about Daniel Jones has had pretty much the same A dot his entire career. Uh, last year, we saw the completion, completion percentage go up a little bit, but he seems like the kind of guy that he'll just take the safety blanket for Waller uh, and target him relentlessly. And also, Scott, I think he's got pretty high touchdown uh, upside uh, in this offense because I think he's by far their largest receiver and, you know, been the most effective touchdown scorer out of this group. Do you think that there is a little bit uh, – the market is – like he's moved up to tight end four. You have him tight end three. But do you think like the market needs to adjust even more? 
Uh, I, I just think he should be tight end three. Uh, yeah, it was wild when he was like tight end nine and underdog yeah. drafts like all season. Uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, that's something I've heard out of Giants camp too, that Daniel Jones, I think last year or w- right before they signed Kenny Galladay was asking for a tall, big bodied possession receiver. And like, <laughs> Kenny Galladay has been a uh, toast for a long time, but like that's clearly Darren Waller. It seems like they have this great connection that should help in the red zone. Uh, Daniel Jones is another player I'm super high on only 15 passing touchdowns last year. Uh, that's going to regress in a positive way for sure. And you have to think Darren Waller, uh, can be a focal point, uh, inside the red zone. He, he brings something unique that I don't think the other receivers are bringing to the table. Yeah. Daniel Jones asked for tall, big body possession receivers. They give him Wandale Robinson. Uh, no, but now he has Darren Waller. Uh, yeah. So, so bullish on, on him and, and really this offense in general. Yeah, I love the Daniel Jones call. Um, you know, he ran for 700 yards last year, and people don't even like talk about that. Uh, and that was year one for Dable. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan as well. I love I love their their correlation, uh, them drafting them as a correlation play as well. Um, I've done it in best ball. I'd like to have a little more of it in redraft. I uh, want to talk about 2019. You were famously in on Lamar Jackson. Uh, he was a major part of my fantasy success in 2019. I had a couple of, of big high stakes teams that did well that year with him. Um, but now you're seeing like, and I guess that year we'll, we'll call him quarterback 10, well, ADP wise, and he crushed it somewhere quarterback 10 to 12, uh, was where he ended up ADP wise. Now it's getting harder and harder to find late round QBs that are hidden. I know last year we saw Trevor Lawrence, we saw Justin Fields, but this year you're seeing Patrick Mahomes getting steamed up big time. Like if you want to get him in an FFPC draft, you're talking about taking him at the two, three turn. Once in a while, he goes a little higher. Our friend of B-Bag Batoba was in an FFPC main event and somebody took Mahomes at the end of the first round. So the enthusiasm is, is there. Um, you also have Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, and now Lamar Jackson being steamed up. Do you think following the big four and getting exposure to some of them is the right approach this year, Scott? Or are you looking at maybe the next tier of quarterbacks or even the next tier below that when you're drafting these days? Yeah, I just want to say uh, Lamar Jackson was QB 14, uh, 101 MVP odds when I when I bet him that offseason. Yeah, so I think it really depends where you're drafting on. If this is like a traditional 12 team league, you're not going to be drafting the quarterbacks at those prices. This is an underdog tournament where you can stack and, you know, you have to progress throughout each round of the playoffs. Uh, I think that's definitely viable. I I'm personally going that route. I have a ton of Kelsey Mahomes teams and then in an FFPC team, it's somewhere in the middle, uh, you know, getting sort of those, those power law outcomes for the bonus rounds can be valuable. Like if Patrick Mahomes, you know, is the QB one throughout the postseason weeks that can give you a big edge, but it's different than underdog in that you're not getting knocked out. So to me, I I just don't think that's as crucial. Um, And I just personally had so much success in FFPC over the years, kind of just like really punting that position. Um, So I think in that format, I would be more inclined to taking uh, a later round quarterback approach. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. It'll be interesting to see kind of where the market ends up this month, especially when we get to some of the higher higher uh, value drafts. Um, one other big reaction we've seen from last season is we're seeing the ever so common Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes stack and correlation play. You saw this last year as well, but last year Mahomes was not being drafted as high. He was going off the board as QB3 behind Justin Herbert for much of the summer, and he also was going rounds later. So last year, drafters did, had to spend a little lower uh, draft pick on Kelsey and also a lower draft pick on Mahomes. Those teams did great. I think it was 50% or something like that, 40% of the FFPC uh, main event teams all had Josh Allen or Mahomes. So drafting those guys made a lot of sense, uh, and it paid out. Now you're talking about, from a game theory perspective, if 40 to 50% of the field has Mahomes and Kelsey as a stack, and you could take this in best ball or redraft, Scott, because you're seeing it in every single underdog draft you're in as well. Every single FFPC draft I'm in, every NFFC draft, you'll see it in home leagues. 
people want that that you know correlation between Kelsey and Mahomes. When something becomes so common, is it something you should avoid, or do you want exposure to it because it could be so impactful? Yeah, I think in FFPC non best ball, like that's massively <coughs> overrated. Uh, stacking is stacking is massively overrated. Um, in fact, it could potentially be harmful to your team. Like imagine and you have so much draft capital riding on two players on the same team. What if Patrick Mahomes misses week 14, right? That's the championship week. I think then you're screwed. You miss out on a lot of money, right? So, um, I just, I just don't see the edge there for, for best ball tournaments. I, I, I do. Uh, but I, I really think when you're talking about like moving needles, it's not going to be the players with round one, round two ADP. Uh, you know, their price as if they're going to be dominant players. So there's no real edge. It's, it's like drafting Mahomes his sophomore season or drafting Josh Allen a year ago. Uh, those players who are both undervalued themselves and their stacking partners are undervalued. That That's where the edge is. Like, I don't know who won FFPC in 2018, the, the Patrick Mahomes sophomore season, but I imagine it was probably just some like Kansas City fan who had a ton of Tyreek, Kelsey, Mahomes, Kareem Hunt. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely it's definitely interesting. And you bring up another another stack, the Mark Andrews, Lamar Jackson uh combination. You're seeing that a lot. Would you take that even a step further and just say, you know, it's even less impactful and something you should avoid? Or do you think that that's a stack that you could get into because the cost is less? Yeah, I'd say I, I'm I'm probably agnostic on it. I think that's fine. Okay. But it's, uh, it's yeah. not really about the stack to me. It's just like in tight end premium leagues, Andrews is appropriate, appropriately priced uh, and Lamar is probably a slight value. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely interesting. And you bring up about the pitfalls that can happen. I mean, if you're betting on two things and one goes wrong, you know, you're, the other one is affected, uh, especially in those money weeks where it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'd say also a lot of times we're seeing the, the stacks that are, that are very popular um, in August and September are not necessarily the ones that pay out at the very end of the season, whether it's best ball, whether it's, uh, you know, FFPC or any of the other high stakes formats. When I'd be stacking quarterbacks in FFPC, it would be the cheaper quarterback. It's like a bet on Deshaun Watson returning to the Deshaun Watson of old. And I drafted Cooper and I drafted Elijah. Something along those lines is like, oh, based on this one thing, we could get an easy power law offense. And so let's it like, uh, la last year I, I, uh, drafted a, uh, Judy Sutton, uh, or maybe it was the year before that Judy Rod, uh, Sutton and Rogers, just like there was like all the, the speculation about Rogers going there. Like, Oh, like if that happens, yeah. you know, like all their ADPs jump by so many rounds. Um, it's yeah, you, you want, you want, there, there's no edge there with the around to Mahomes. It's you, there is for if Deshaun Watson were like returns value equivalent to like four rounds past his current ADP. Yeah, no, for sure. Want to pivot over. There's one player who's been getting selected in the first round, usually doesn't last past the, the one, two turn. I have a, maybe a 204 is my low for him uh, in a, in a redraft league. But one player who you're not into, Scott, uh, at his cost, we talked about it last time you were on, is C.D. Lamb. This is kind of polarizing. There's a lot of people who really want to believe in C.D. Lamb this year as, um, you know, a slam dunk pick that's going to return, you know, 17 to 8 to 20 points per game. He's an ascending young talent and the focal point of Dallas's offense. What do you say to that? Um, and how do you see C.D. Lamb as how how, how should he be priced? Yeah, this, this is going to sound like a hot take or uh, I'm really confident in it. I'm, I'm not. Um, I think he's a really talented player. Like I, I loved him as a prospect coming out, obviously like really productive last season. But but to me, he's just kind of like underwhelmed in every year of his career. He was never as productive as the worth of his role might imply. 
you know, really good volume, kind of underwhelming product. He had that massive spike week last year against the Eagles, but it came with their starting slot corner getting hurt on the first play of the game. Uh, over their last 20 games, he's only barely outproduced Dalton Schultz. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Keenan Allen outscores him this year. Why? Because Keenan Allen's getting the uh, CD Lamb role in the in the uh, Kellen Moore offense. <laughs> what is CD Lamb getting? You know, a, a way less exciting offense that should be very run heavy, run at a much slower pace. Um, so yeah, he's he's just not someone I'm ever really drafting. And de facto, are you also off of Brandon Cooks as a? We had Rich Rebar sitting in your seat on press coverage a couple of weeks ago. Rich Rebar is big on on Brandon Cooks this year as a value. When we talked about you know maybe this year's Amari Cooper, Tyler Lockett, boring veteran that could return some value. Do you see Brandon Cooks as maybe a little bit more of a threat to have not similar? but enough volume that it could affect CD lamb. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I think that's, what's going to happen. I think he's a great value in best ball. He's just not someone who gets me super excited and start sit leagues, but yeah, I, I think there's like a 90% chance he beats whatever his ADP is this year. Yeah. I don't think 29 year old Brandon cooks really falls into upside wins championship, <laughs> but he still could be a guy you could plug into the flex. So I, I, he's definitely an interesting player to me. One other wide receiver that I, you're very much into, and I am as well, is Elijah Moore. We have people flexing on their Elijah Moore uh, uh, $5 in a dynasty auction. I'm going to assume that's Dio and Scott Barrett approved. It is approved. This is uh, Elijah Moore season. He's back. No reason to take an L. You just wait. Uh, so last year, all my takes on Elijah Moore, they're going to come into fruition this year. Scott, what do you say? Yeah, I, absolutely. This is a player... You know, I've been borderline obsessed with uh, since he declared for the NFL draft. Uh, amazing prospect, the most yards from scrimmage per game of any Power Five wide receiver since at least 2000. Loved his tape. He, I saw PPR cheat code upside. Plus, he could flash as a deep threat, a la T.Y. Hilton, uh, Tyler Lockett. Uh, massive upside. Uh, was really good as a rookie, as a sophomore. I don't know. You got to watch the tape, man. Like he seemed, it seemed like he was still always open, but they were just never looking at him when they did throw it. The ball sailed 20 yards over his head. The coaching staff hated him. And now coaching staff supposedly loves him supposedly, you know, featuring him, lining him up all over the formation has a really good quarterback who could be great this year. Uh, it would not surprise, like I might just be, He's suffering from Elijah Moore derangement syndrome, but it really wouldn't surprise me if Elijah Moore is the wide receiver one for the Cleveland Browns this year, at least on like a targets per game basis. I love that. And we've on, we've talked about our fades on, on first class fantasy. If you want to tune in, Billy and I talked about some players who are fading and Amari Cooper's always kind of come up as one. I think he's getting way, way overdrafted this season. And I think Elijah Moore is a big part of that. Um, I love the idea of getting him manufactured touches uh, this is a guy that had uh, two top three weeks um, among all wide receivers in his rookie season. He also had another top 10 week. So this is a guy that, you know, it's not like we're we're saying we want this to happen. Like we've already seen this on an NFL field. And I think the Browns very much need him to be a playmaker to challenge that for that division. So I'm, I'm all in on that one. I, I love that you're in on that one as well. Uh, Cleveland is a team that a lot of people have talked about as an offense. that's going to take a big step forward. That was kind of like a cool thing to say a couple months ago. Now the ADPs have all adjusted. But breakout offenses have to be a big part of our game plan as drafters. Last year, we saw ADP wins by simply selecting the correct offenses that were mispriced by the market or underrated. Seattle, we saw Lockett, Metcalf, Ken Walker, and Geno Smith off the waiver wire. Um, they were very, very big time with that. Miami with Tua and also Tyree Kill and Waddle smashing ADP. Jacksonville had multiple players. And then the biggest one was Philadelphia. Philadelphia, you saw Jalen Hurts win leagues. A.J. Brown was a, a borderline league winner. Devonta Smith was certainly probably the best pick in any player in his range. And Dallas Goddard had some big-time boom weeks. And Miles Sanders finishes as a top 15 running back. What are some offenses, Scott, that you think could take a big step forward um, where maybe they could carry the tide for several players beating ADP? 
Yeah, I think the Browns are a good one. I think uh, the Dolphins are. A good, I think Tua could have won MVP last year if he never suffered a concussion. That was really looking like a juggernaut offense. I think. Uh, I think Aaron Rodgers and the Jets. Like the dude has won MVP in each of his last two seasons with Nathaniel Hackett, or each of his last two seasons without a broken thumb. Um, but I think I think uh, the offense that stands out to me most of all, and we, we keep touching on it is the chargers who they ranked they had they ran the most or the second most plays last season uh uh it felt like more like three times as many pass attempts per game as chicago or atlanta uh justin herbert was dealing with a very serious rib cartilage injury from week two on clearly wasn't playing right he didn't have his left tackle and so this was already a high volume, fast paced offense, but now every single player is saying, Oh, I I'm, I'm blown away by how fast the tempo is in this Kellen Moore offense. And like, there's, it's, it's almost unfathomable to imagine what kind of volume we're in store for, if that is the case. And at a bare minimum, I think Kellen Moore is smart enough to, you know, kind of rein in some of these empty Austin Eckler checkdowns that do nothing and, and let this, you know, golden haired God with like, a howitzer for an arm actually throw the ball downfield. So, uh, yeah, really, probably those offenses are, are sticking out the most to me. Yeah, no, I, I love that one. I also think that the Giants, you referenced Waller, yeah. you referenced Daniel Jones, and I think that they'll support. It's a it's a, a thankless task for us to try to pick which wide receiver. I'm sure we might have conflicting ideas, but I think one wide receiver is going to finish maybe inside the top 30 as well for New York. I think that that's it'll, the things will work themselves out. Um, and then I think Saquon Barkley, Darren Waller and Daniel Jones could all, could all hit at ADP. So I love your answer on Miami. Um, I've been drafting Devon a chain. This is one guy I don't know your opinion on Scott. Are you uh, intrigued by a chain? Uh, not really. Not really. Uh, okay. I kind of have to see it first. I just, uh, his, his body type composition just kind of screams to me a guy who will ever forever be capped at like eight to 12 touches per game with nothing beyond that. Uh, maybe he gets enough work as receiver. I don't know. Maybe he's, you know, Chris Johnson, but for now I'm treating it as if there was only ever one Chris Johnson. I'll take a much, much better Tariq Cohen. That would be my, my, my uh, bull case where he's going to finish like RB 20 but he's going to have those big impactful weeks that can help us at times. Cause I do think he's going to be used as a receiver. So I'm, I'm intrigued by him. And if you're on the, the two a track, I think they can support a third guy in that offense. Want to pick your brain on these older wide receivers. You talked about Keenan Allen. We see this, a number of these wide receivers that are like 30 and 30 near 30 or over 30. Um, and a lot of them are going in the first round and then Allen, he's a lock third rounder. So you have uh, you have uh, Devontae Adams, you have Tyree Kill, you have Cooper Cup, you have Ty, um, who am I forgetting here? Stephon Diggs. Which of these players are you most concerned about taking a step back this year? Uh, prob- probably none of them, okay. honestly. Uh, like our injury expert Edwin Porras talks about this a lot. We're like the most talented players in the league tend to like the aging curves don't really apply to them just because they have a deeper reservoir of talent to draw from Adam Harsed talks about this as well. Um, and none of them really showed a, a decline last season. Um, yeah, probably no one to be honest. Uh, I mean, Adams, but like, that's not related to age. That's just. And his ADP is already corrected. Like Adams, you're getting in the the middle of the second round. So it's like, it's not like you're having to take him at six overall. Um, I, I just think the Raiders are going to be so awful this year. And it's also like, okay, he was still really solid, but he was also playing with his boy, Derek Carr. And like his first read target share was insane. Like Carr just locked onto him. It's like either it's going to be a turnover downs or my guy Adams is going to get four consecutive targets. Uh, and I just don't know that Jimmy Garoppolo is going to do that. I don't know. He, he, he has the arm strength to hit him deep like Derek Carr and Aaron Rodgers did consistently. Um, but I'm not out on I'm, I, He's He's fine. I would just say I'm, I'm worried most about him. Yeah, no, no, for sure. He's been, most people have been on the, the Devonte Adams is the most risky of the big four. 
but I don't know. I think it's already kind of adjusted. And last year he has a career high in, in targets and air yards, finishes wide receiver three. So, I mean, he's pretty insulated in my opinion as well. Well, um, want to talk a little bit of dynasty. We're at 55 minutes in. We're in the same dynasty league this year, Scott. So we're, I'm rebuilding. You're going for it. Black Crown League run by Curtis Patrick. Um, check out Curtis's work at Rotoviz. It's really, really good stuff. But Scott, right now you have a very clear one-two at dynasty. For most startup drafts that are non-super flex, it's Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. A little bit of B. John Robinson mixed in, but it's mostly those big two. And then in terms of wide receiver rankings, it's almost a unanimous big two. Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. Then you, when we talk about wide receiver three overall, we have a conversation. Some people might say, you know, A.J. Brown. Some people might say Alman Ross St. Brown. You could name four or five guys um, that, are, that are maybe wide receiver three. A year from now, if there is a wide receiver that has broken into the Jefferson Chase God tier, who would it be? Who would be the guy that you would bet on, if any, to take that next step? Yeah, definitely Garrett Wilson. Easily. There you go. That's that's the you should be wide receiver three right now. That's the answer. I love that one. I love that one. It's clearly Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson flashed it last year. He's got the opportunity this year. And offensive rookie of the year has been a really good indicator um, of future fantasy success from non quarterbacks. If you go down the list of like the last like eight of them, they've all taken a big step forward you know, in points per game. I think uh, Gurley was the only one to kind of kind of go down. So I love that answer. Your thoughts of, of how Wilson's going to do this year in New York. Um, do you buy into anything about, you know, maybe the offense being too slow um, with Hackett and Rogers, or do you think he's just going to go nuts? I just think he's going to go nuts. I think, I think like uh, we talked about like those offenses to, to bet on. I think those are all great MVP bets. Uh, Justin Herbert, Aaron Rodgers, also like Brock Purdy at some insane odds. Uh, but yeah, again, like he won MVP in two of his last two seasons with Hackett, two of his last two seasons without a broken thumb to his throwing hand. Um, familiarity in the offense. Uh, I think Garrett Wilson is just insanely talented. I think Rodgers is going to target him as such. Um, you know, there's all this hype building around uh, hard knocks and how he's like practicing against Sauce Gardner every single day. And like Sauce Gardner's insanely elite. And uh, Coach Salas said, oh, these two are going to make them better. Like, I I think that's a real thing. I, I just think he's awesome. I think he now, like, he got it done and won Offensive Rookie of the Year with, like, the worst quarterback play in football. So, uh, yeah, I, I just think uh, I think this one's easy. No, I, I love I love Wilson. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're on Wilson. That's, that's awesome. Scott, you've been very generous with your takes today, been generous with your time. Let everybody know where they can find your work. Um, and the big article where they can find that again. Yeah, that's uh, at fantasypoints.com. You could follow me on Twitter at Scott Barrett DFB. Yeah, definitely follow Scott and definitely consider purchasing uh, his draft guide. It's it's a fantastic article. And can they reference any of the older articles for free, Scott, or are those behind the paywall? Sorry, what was that? The 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 upside wins championships is that. Oh, one? that one's that one's free. Uh, that's in my pen tweet. Yeah, so definitely check out Scott's uh, pin tweet that has a lot of evergreen concepts that we talked about today. Um, and definitely tune in next week. Uh, Billy Muzio and I are going to have Darren Armani Fantasy Mojo, and we're also going to have Chad Schroeder uh, with us on First Class Fantasy. I'm going to have a couple of more uh, really cool guests on press coverage all summer long. Uh, we're going to try to do our best to help you win your leagues, and everybody have a wonderful weekend. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All In Package to continue to make all of this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.